Father, thank you for giving us the gift of allowing us to join together. Whether we're here in person or anywhere in the world joining in, let us take this time, enjoy this moment, and make sure that we dedicate this to you. Give us the ability to focus. Give us the ability to put everything else aside. And let us be here. Amen. The greatest day in history Death is beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive Empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Sing, oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same Forever I am changed oh. When I stand in that place Free at last, meeting face to face I am yours, Jesus, you are mine this joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will see. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive, and oh, happy day, happy day. He washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same Forever I am changed oh. And sing, oh What a glorious day What a glorious way That you have saved me Sing, oh what a glorious way, yeah, what a glorious name. Oh, sing, oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed What a glorious, glorious day I'll never be the same Amen Let's keep up the vibes. I love the smiles. If you're at home, I feel you smiling. Just keep on doing it. Let's keep on singing. The song is called Praise. If you know it, sing along. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I praise in the valley. I praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure. I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered. I praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters My enemies drown in As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise 
the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I praise when I feel it. I praise when I don't. I pray when I know that you're in control. My praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. My praise is a shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. No, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How can I keep it inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Cause you're sovereign, I praise cause you reign, I praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, I praise cause you're faithful, I praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you, I praise cause you're sovereign, I praise cause you reign, I praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, I praise cause there's nobody greater than you, praise Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Sing, I won't be quiet. No, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? Again, I won't be quiet. I don't be lying. I heard I keep it inside. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. Enjoy this moment right here. Smile at the person next to you. If you're watching live from home, find a mirror and give yourself a smile. Today's a happy day. So let's keep on celebrating. Sing I Search the World. I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here 
giving you love Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend God of the mountain Is the God of there's not a place that your mercy and grace won't find me again no Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you to dancing you give beauty to ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty to ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can Is the one who can Sing there's nothing nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you so you turn morning to dancing. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty to ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can.
A thousand generations Falling down in worship To sing the song of ages to the Lamb And all who have gone before us And all who will believe Will sing the song of ages to the Lamb Your name is the highest Your name is the greatest Your name stands above them all All thrones and dominions All powers and positions Your name stands above them all And the angels cry Holy all creation cries Holy You are lifted high Holy Holy forever If you've been forgiven If you've been redeemed Sing the song river to the Lamb If you walk in freedom And if you bear His name Sing the song forever to the Lamb We'll sing the song forever to the Lamb Jews cry All creation cries Holy You are lifted high Holy Holy forever Your people sing Holy To the King of Kings Is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all All thrones and dominions All powers and positions Your name stands above them all And the angels cry Holy All creation cries
King of kings, to the Lord of lords. You are the ancient of days. You are the rock of ages. You are the rock on which we stand. We bow before you this afternoon and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lord God Almighty who is who was and who will always be. We bless your name, Jehovah God. We exalt you, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. You are all together beautiful. You are all together awesome. You are highly lifted up. Blessed be your name. We love you, Master. We give you the praise and the glory. We thank you for the wonderful week. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you that we are whole. Thank you for healing. Thank you for providing for all our needs. Thank you for our loved ones. Thank you for a peaceful, prosperous nation. We bless your name, Jesus. We give you the praise and the glory. Father, as we continue with this worship service, may you accept our songs, may you accept our praises, may you accept our prayers, may you accept and anoint the preaching of your word. We thank you, dear God, for everything we will do here in your name. May it be acceptable unto you. Thank you for the tithes and the offerings that your people will give. May you bless them and increase them. May you protect them from the devourer to the praise of your name. If anybody is following us on YouTube or Facebook and they are unwell or they are in this service and they are not feeling well, I speak the healing power of God in the name of Jesus. May the anointing in this altar touch them on their bodies in the name of Jesus. Father God, if somebody is struggling in their marriage, and in their relationships, come through for them. Be their peace. Be their answer. In the name of Jesus. If somebody is struggling in the area of their finances, come through for them, dear God. I pray, dear Father, for your provision. Thank you for every job you've given us. Thank you for business opportunities. To you, God, be all the praise and the glory. And now, our Father and our God, we pray for the peace of the Middle East. It is your desire for your children to live in peace. We pray, God, for the peace of Israel. We pray, dear God, for every Palestinian family and every Jewish family. Come through for them, Jehovah God. Cause your peace to flow in that region. We pray for the peace of Ukraine. May you stop the bloodshed, Jehovah God. May you stop the bombings, almighty God. Only you can stop the aggression of Russia. May you come through for that great nation of Ukraine. In the name of Jesus. Blessed Savior and blessed Master. We thank you for the church of Jesus Christ around the world. Lord Jesus, may you revive your church. May you revive your people. May you cause some revival to flow in your church, O oh God. We love you, Master. We give you the praise and the glory. Oh, you are beautiful in our midst. You are awesome in your church. Oh, you are lifted up on high. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the young men who have been leading us in praise and worship in this church. 
May you continue using them for your glory. May you continue blessing them, Jehovah God. We thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children say, Amen and Amen. Please let, let's stand for a few moments and profess our faith in Christ. One, two, go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of their body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Can we start just for a few moments? This is the only time I request your smile and your charm, your charisma, your oomph. Let's say it from the bottom of our hearts. Want to go and do it some style, do it some pride. I am loved by God. I am blessed. I am highly favored. I am healthy. I am happy. I am good looking. I am in great shape. I am secure. I am motivated. I am positive. I am valuable. I am needed. I am determined. I am purposeful. I am successful. I am prosperous. I am victorious. I am an achiever. I am empowered. I am loving. I am peaceful. I am forgiving. I am patient. I am kind. I am generous. I am well able as Jesus is in glory. So I am here on earth. Amen. Walk around, hug somebody, say hi to somebody. Oh, beautiful. Good morning. I love you guys. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for coming to church. You could have chosen to be anywhere. You chose to be in the house of God. It's not easy to go to church in a prosperous country where people feel they have everything. It takes a lot of discipline to wake up and go to church, and I don't take that for granted. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> but there are a lot of benefits for coming to the house of God. You agree? Yeah. yeah. I mean, rarely, rarely do you get people inspired in you in your day-to-day -day life. And uh, let's take a few moments and give to God part of what he has given us. It's your free offering. You can use the giving options on the screen. And uh, that's our preferred option. Just in case you wanted to give cash or a check, don't feel constrained at the end of the service. You can always deposit at the offertory box right here. Hope you had a good week. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I like exchanging soft sermons and a little bit challenging sermons because we need both the milk and the bones to chew. So today, I uh, will present to us a little bit of a challenging subject just to reflect on our Christian walk. So I'll speak on the subject, victory over the sin that slows us down. Victory over the sin that slows you down. 
Sin does not hurt because it is forbidden. Sin is, sin is forbidden because it hurts us. There is something about the forbidden fruit that makes it irresistibly desirable to mankind. This subject of sin is not a comfortable theme. Whenever we hear sin discussed, we feel exposed. We feel vulnerable. We feel reminded of our shortcomings and our weaknesses. In one of his books, William Shakespeare wrote, few love to hear the sins they love to act. The good news is that sin does not stop God's grace from flowing, but God's grace stops sin. In Titus 2.12, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. We are born sinners. And by sin, I mean sin is rebellion against God. Rebellion against God. Refusing to yield to the will of God. In fact, Romans 3.23, later reads this truth. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And when Jesus was teaching, he made it clear to us that God's standard of righteousness is too high, in fact, for us to reach in our own human efforts. For example, Jesus said, you have been told do not commit adultery. But let me tell you God's standard. If you look at someone lustfully, you have already committed adultery. God's standard is too high. The fact remains, we all struggle with sin. Everyone struggles with sin. The greatest apostle of all times, the apostle Paul, was vulnerable with us. He did not hide this struggle. In Romans 7.15, he describes his struggle with sin. He writes, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Think about that. I don't understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I end up doing what I hate. If that is the case, verse 17, so then, I'm not the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. If I do what I hate, and I don't do what I like to do, then something is controlling me. That is the sin that lives in me. Sin, even if legalized by the U.S. Congress or the Dutch government or by any man, is still sin by God. Sin, even if legalized by man, is still sin before God. And we may ask ourselves, where is the origin of sin? Where did sin come from? The truth is, we inherited our sinful nature from our first parents. So the Bible describes clearly when Adam and Eve sinned, we all sinned. Romans 5.12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. For everyone sinned. When Adam sinned, everyone sinned. Why? We are their seed. We inherited the seed of Adam, the fallen seed, the fallen nature. Technically, we are sinners by nature and by practice. And that's why the Bible says Jesus never sinned. He never inherited our sinful nature. He was the seed of the Holy Spirit. He never inherited our fallen nature. We are sinners by nature and by practice, by doing. But while we all have inherited the sinful nature, every one of us here has an individual sin that frustrates us. Everybody has a sin that slows them down. The Bible talks about it in Hebrews 12, verse 1. 
Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. The writer here is saying salvation is a marathon. Let us run with endurance. It's in marathon where you need endurance, resilience, persistence, consistency in the journey because it's long. You've got to have endurance to run marathon. Now, in March and April 2019, my Masi and I hiked Mount Kilimanjaro twice. And I remember when we were doing the summit attempt, Uhuru Peak, 5,000 895 meters above the sea level. For your info, Mount Kilimanjaro is the highest freestanding mountain in the world. The Everest, which is much higher, 8848 meters above the sea level, is part of the Himalayas. The Himalayas ridges has over 100 mountains above 6,000 meters, over 100 of them. So the Everest is part of the Himalayas, but Mount Kilimanjaro is the highest freestanding mountain. And uh, you go to an extent, you start seeing the clouds below you. So the summit attempt, we started at 11 p.m. and we, we reached the summit at 9 a.m. And before the summit attempt, we had walked for four days, almost nonstop. It pushes, it stretches you completely to the limits. And the oxygen levels plummet, they sink. The temperature goes to negative 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, you doubt your sanity. You keep checking whether you're still alive. And you put on clothes and layers and layers and layers. But on the summit attempt, you leave everything at the base camp. You only carry what is essential, water and some nuts. Because you don't want any weight. And you walk very slowly, one step after another. And you keep thinking you're still alive. And you wonder, what brought me here? But the point is, you leave all your luggage at the base camp. And that's exactly what he's saying. Let us strip off every weight. Carry only what you must. Leave unnecessary baggage of bitterness and anger and malice and envy. Unnecessary competition and hate. People who offended you 10 years ago. They are just slowing you down. They will make you compromise summiting and seeing the beautiful sunrise from above the clouds. Let us trip off. This is your duty. This is not God's role. This is your responsibility to strip off, to lay down unnecessary weight. Then he adds, especially, especially that scene that so easily trips us up. To trip is to make you to stumble. You're in a race, you're running, then you stumble. If you keep doing that, even if you finish the race, you may not win. It's a race. A race means you need to win. But something may make you keep stumbling and tripping, and that's the scene that so easily trips us up. English Standard Version says clings. Let us lay aside especially the sin that clings, that keeps on clinging on us. The King James Version, especially the sin that so easily besets us. NIV, the sin that so easily entangles, entangle, to intertwine, to intertwist. It's like strings and ropes intertwining around you. You won't be able to run effectively. Let us lay aside that sin that so easily traps us, and ensnares us. That's the word here. Why? Because sin makes us feel guilty. And when we feel guilty, we fear coming to the holy presence of God. When the first man sinned, Adam, what did he do? Him and his wife went hiding. Before sin, they were in perfect fellowship with God. When they sinned, they began to run away from God. They went hiding. And they were ashamed. They were ashamed. They tried to cover themselves with twigs. See, when we sin, we feel embarrassed. We feel too ashamed to come to God. And that's where the problem is. 
Because if you try to run away from God, you get disconnected from the source. Think about this. If a fish gets out of the water, it dies. It's disconnected from its source. God spoke to the oceans to give rice to all the animals. You don't need to kill a fish. You just need to get him out of the water, and he can't breathe. If you get a tree out of the land, it dies, because God spoke to the land to produce the trees and vegetation. You get the tree out of the ground, it dies. You get man out of God, he dies. Why? Man is the breath of God. God breathed into men, and man became a living being. So once you're disconnected from the source, you die. You compromise your destiny. Then how do we defeat that sin that slows us down? That's the real question before us this afternoon. How do we defeat the sin that slows us down? Three steps. Step number one, accept Jesus as Savior. If you can hear my voice, and you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you truly, truly want to defeat that sin that keeps you down, you've got to accept Jesus as your Savior. Sin is bondage. Sin blights us. What well, that means, if you do a certain sin for so long, it becomes your new norm. You accept it as part of life. You start thinking and imagining everyone else is doing that sin. You start thinking. When you do a sin for so long, you start to console yourself. You start imagining everybody else struggles with that sin. No, 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 no. The fact that you're struggling with that sin doesn't mean everybody else struggles with that sin. They have the sin they struggle with. Every individual has a certain thing they struggle with. So when you, when you allow that sin to become part of your life, it becomes a bondage. And the Lord talked about it in John 8, 34. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. That means he is in prison. He is in a cage, in a jail. If you sin, you are actually in a bondage. You are enslaved by that sin. That sin has mastered you. It has control over your life. You've lost control over this sin. It has mastered you. It has enslaved you. You are unable to overcome it. You are unable to prison break. In Romans 7.24, Paul was expressing his frustration with sin. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this prison? Who will free me from this prison of sin? Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? What is the answer? Or... Where is the answer? What is the solution to this bondage? Who will get me out of this prison? Who will open the prison gates? In the immediate next verse, he gives the answer. Verse 25, Romans 7, 25. Thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the only one who can open the prison gates and free you. So, you see how it is? In my mind, I didn't want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. There is nothing else and no one else who can open the prison gates. And the Lord Jesus affirmed this statement in John 8, 36. He said that I quote, If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. If the Son of God opens the prison gate, the prison of sin, only then can you be truly free from that sin that slows you down, from that sin that slowly kills you, from that sin that compromises you coming to the presence of God, from that sin that can potentially compromise your destiny. You might challenge me this afternoon and say, Pastor, hey, I know some guys who are born again. They have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ but they are still struggling with a certain sin. I know them. And I know they are struggling with sin. And they are born again. You are right in your analysis. We need to move from step number one and go to step number two. Allow Jesus to be your Lord. You see how it works, ladies and gentlemen. Allowing Jesus to be your Savior is him opening the prison gates. But after he opens the prison gate, you don't know the way. He has to lead the path. 
If you don't give him a chance to lead you, you're going to wallow in confusion and in darkness. And the only place you can see is back to your cage, back to your prison. You're going to lock yourself up again. So once he opens the prison gate, that's the salvation gate. The next thing is for him to lead you on the path. It's for him to lead you the way, to allow him to be your Lord. That's why there are many believers. Jesus is their Savior, but Jesus is not their Lord. He is not the king in their heart. He is not Lord. How do you know that Jesus is your Lord? If in everything you do, in everything you say, you can with integrity ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Then he is Lord. For example, before doing anything, you ask yourself this question. Would Jesus do what I'm about to do? Would Jesus say what I'm about to say? Would Jesus choose the words I choose to use, my working vocabulary? Would he use it? Would Jesus go where I'm about to go this Friday night? Would Jesus give what I'm about to give in church right now? How would Jesus treat his wife? How would Jesus answer her husband? How would Jesus treat his child when they have done a mistake, when they have refused to go to school, when they have failed a test, when they have gotten pregnant at the age of 14? How would Jesus handle them? How would Jesus drive in the midst of severe road rage, someone tailgating you? How would you react to them in the streets? How would Jesus eat? Would he eat this much at one sitting? How would Jesus dress? How would Jesus respond when provoked by somebody? If you can answer that question, then Jesus is your Lord. What would Jesus do? This is not my original phrase. It's associated with the navigators. But it's a strong way of assessing whether Jesus is your Lord. What would Jesus do? If that is your guiding attitude, your guiding spirit, then Jesus is your Lord. The Lord Jesus said in John 10, 27 to 28, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. It was very deliberate why Jesus chose the word sheep. Because goats refuse to follow their shepherd. They do what they feel like. Jesus deliberately used the word sheep. Because it is, sheep behave like they're stupid. I came from a place where people used to keep sheep. I know them. Sheep just follow the path. They don't deviate to the right or to the left. And that's what he's saying. Trust me, the way a sheep trusts the shepherd. If a sheep does not trust the shepherd, it will be devoured by hyenas and leopards Bears and lions and tigers, depending on the area where the sheep are. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. They don't argue with me. I am their Lord. I am the good shepherd. My sheep can hear my voice and they follow me. And because they follow me, what do they benefit? Or how do they benefit by doing that? What is seen there for the sheep? Verse 28. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them from me. No one can kill them. They can't be destroyed by the enemy out there. The truth of the matter is, if Jesus is your Lord, you can hear his voice. You obey his voice. God does not speak for us just to hear his voice. God speaks for us to obey his voice, to obey his word. And let me give an example of what is obeying the Lord. Jesus said, this is my commandment. This is the summary of every commandment I've given you, that you love one another. If you find yourself hating people right now because they're Palestinians, if you find hating people right now because they're Jews, if you find hating people right now because you feel they are your, in your, they are your subordinates, you're the boss, and you know this is my business, this is my company, if you think someone is your subject, you can't love them. You have already broken this command. 
My sheep hear my voice. It doesn't matter whether they are your employees. It doesn't matter the relationship you have with them. His commandment was, we love one another. So if you can obey his commands, then you are part of his flock. In John 15, 7, Jesus said, But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. The context. The Lord began by saying, I am the true vine. You are the branches. I am the main tree. You are the branches. If you cut a branch from the tree, it dies. It's that simple. It is rice, it is green, it's good, it's fruitful. So long as it abides inside the vine, it is attached, it is linked, it abides with the vine. You cut it, it's dead. On its own, it's dead. So Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, we have a relationship. Now you have a right, a legal right to ask me for anything you want. Prayer is not saying words to God. No, 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 no. Prayer is a relationship with God. It's a relationship. And that's what Jesus is saying. If we have a relationship, then you have a right. You don't come to me begging. There is no love in begging. For God so loved us. When you love someone, they don't beg you. If they have to kneel down to beg you to buy them a car, there is no love. That's manipulation. That's using them. If you can beg God, there is no love. God does not want you to come begging him. He wants you to come knowing your rights. You are a child. He made his promises. He's a promise-keeping God. The Bible says, let us approach his throne with confidence. 1 John 5, 14. Let's approach it with confidence. Why? He is our father. He is our father. So long as Jesus is saying, so long as you remain in me, how? My words remain in you. You obey my word, then you have a right to ask for anything you wish because I'm your Lord, I'm your shepherd. So Jesus is our role model. He didn't just come here to die. Of course, that was the main reason. The main reason he came was to die. He was the Lamb of God who came to take away our sins. He was born to die. He's the only one who was born to die. But he came for many reasons, many reasons. One of the reasons why he came into this life was to set an example, was to be our own model, was to show us that Christian life is possible. It is possible to do the will of God. It is possible to submit to the will of the Father. Because Jesus, even though he himself was God in flesh, he submitted to his Father. He showed us it's possible for us to lay down our pride and to be humble to allow him to lead us. Hebrews 4.15, this high priest of ours, this pastor of ours understands our weaknesses. He understands our struggles. He empathizes with our struggles. Why? For he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. The King James would put it this way. This high priest understands our weaknesses. For he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So here is the deal. Jesus is our example. Why? He was tempted in the area of sex. He was tempted in the area of finances. He was tempted in the area of anger. He was tempted in the area of theft, in the area of idolatry, prayerlessness. He was tempted in every single area. But he conquered sin, the world and the devil. He emerged victorious, sinless, Zacchaean. Here is the deal. Jesus is our role model. Don't try to copy your pastor or a certain bishop or a certain prophet or a certain apostle. They will fail you. Your parents will fail your moral standards. Yes, you can find your mom doing the wrong things. Anyone can fail you. If you follow a certain man of God, you'll be so frustrated. Follow Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 of 2, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. King James says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That should be your role model. That should be your focus. 
I repeat again and again, any prophet can fail you, any pastor can fail you, and even if they fail, your faith should not fail you because your faith is not grounded on any man's moral standard but on Christ. You know what? I'm suggesting today Jesus is our role model in prayer. Pray like Jesus prayed. He rose up early in the morning, Mark 1.35, went to a solitary place all alone, knelt down, cried to God with groanings that words cannot express, copied Jesus in the word. He went to the synagogue to be taught the word of God, even though he was the living word of God. Even though he was the word of God, he went to be taught. He humbled himself. He allowed those traditional priests to teach him the word of God. We should copy how Jesus talked. We should copy how Jesus walked, how he submitted to God, how he forgave others. Even at the cross, where they mocked him, they spat on him, they pulled his beard, they knocked his head with a rod again and again and again until it was totally flattened. Finally, when he had some little breath, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. We should copy Jesus, how he treated women, how he treated children, how he treated men, how he treated his opponents, how he handled everyone, even people who were about to be stoned, how he rescued them from mob injustice. We should copy the example of Jesus. And by the way, dear friends, the early church copied the example of Jesus so much that in that great city of Antioch, they were called for the first time Christians. How? The city dwellers in that Greek city observed them. And then they said, you know, these guys, they talk like Christ. They walk like Christ. They love each other like Christ. They behave like Christ. They are Christ-like. They are Christians. That's where the term came from. That's where the term was used for the first time. In fact, it was not a celebratory term. It was derogatory. It was an insult. It was not meant to be a praise. They were talking about the guy, the dude they killed. They look like him. That's how the term was used for the first time. And that's the question before us. Can people see you and see Jesus? Can anybody in your place of work look at you and say, this guy looks like Christ, he talks like Christ, walks like Christ. That's the way he treats people. That's the way he treats his wife. That's the way she treats her husband and her children. This is Christ-like. This is a Christian. Without you announcing, without you ever telling anybody you are Christian, can people see you, listen to you, look at you, and say, this, surely, is a Christian? Only then can you then say, for sure, Jesus is my Lord. Then there is the third step. The third step, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. So step number one, let Jesus be, allow Jesus to be your savior. Step number two, allow Jesus to be your Lord. And step number three, and the highest step, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And the reason I'm saying this, trust me this, <laughs> brethren, my dear friends, God never intended us to live the Christian life by our resolutions or our determination. If you try to make so many resolutions to be a good Christian, and to be extremely determined, let me give you the ad product, the ad game. You'll be so frustrated. You'll be so tired with this Christian work. You may easily throw in the towel. Because you can, you, can, you, can, you can be determined for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. But eventually you'll be so fatigued. Actually, Jesus told his disciples, the, the last word of Christ was not go. I know so many preachers say the last words of Jesus was the Great Commission, go ye, go, 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 go. No, no, no. The last word of Jesus was wait. Wait. Wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power, until you're clothed with power. Wait for the promise of the Father. Wait, wait. Acts 1.8, those are the last words of Christ. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Those are his last words before he ascended on high. His last words were not go. No, uh, 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 wait. Don't do anything. Don't try to lead the Christian life until the Holy Spirit comes in you. Wait, wait. 
Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Anything short of that is a struggle to be a Christian. It's frustrating. And believe me, friends, the overwhelming majority of Christians have not done any research to give you precise statistics, but I can tell you with authority, the majority of Christians struggle in their Christian faith. That's why they even struggle to go to church. They struggle in their Christian walk. Listen, in 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul writes to a very carnal church, a church that struggled with every manner of sin. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who lives in you, who lives in you, and was given to you by God. The Holy Spirit was given to you by God. This was an extremely fallen church, a very carnal church, yet Paul is saying the Holy Spirit lives in you. Do you know what I'm saying to you guys? The Holy Spirit lives in you. If that were not the case, you wouldn't be born again. Jesus said, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Whether you believe it or not, I'm telling you today, every born-again child of God, whether they are Catholics or Anglicans or Methodists or Presbyterians or Baptists or Pentecostals or Apostles, it's immaterial. Every born-again child of God, the Holy Spirit lives in them irrespective of your human judgment on them. Without the Holy Spirit, they could not accept Jesus to be their Savior. Anyone who opens their mouth and says, Jesus is my Savior, irrespective of your opinion about them, the Holy Spirit lives in them. And I'm repeating to you again, the church the Apostle Paul was writing to was in extreme sin. Let me give you an example. We had brothers in this church who would sleep with their father's wife. You know those guys who would have two or three wives? They were in the church, and that was the level of immorality in this church. And Paul would say, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Can you imagine that? And I'm telling you, this is something a lot of people don't understand. So they are busy out there looking for God when he is in you. He is in you. That's why Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit who lives in you. He is in you. He lives in you. The issue is, can you allow him to lead you? When God released the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, that was the birth of the church. You know God's gifts are irrevocable. That's a hard word. Means without repentance. What's that? When God gives you a gift, he does not take it back. Are you with me? So when the church was born, when, the, when God gave the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is in every believer. Everyone who comes and accepts Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you. The question is, how do we ensure he becomes our Lord? And that's the secret I want to give you. Because he's in you. What example can I use? Let's say, let's talk about power at home, electric power. Power is there, but you have to switch on. You have to put on the switch. That's exactly what I'm saying. Until you switch, you, you tap the switch. You turn it on, the room is still dark, but the power is still there. That power is still in you, but you've got to switch it on through prayer, and I'm going to prove to you. That's how you switch that power on. Look at that verse again. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you a question. What is the purpose of a temple? Talk to me. In one word, what is the purpose of a temple? Prayer. That's the purpose of a temple. Whether it's a Hindu temple or a Jewish temple, it doesn't matter. The purpose of a temple is prayer. He says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit wants to pray in this temple. Just surrender. Just yield. The Bible says, offer to God your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. You just yield to him, he will pray through you. He will pray through you. He wants to use your body as the temple, as his temple. Your body is his temple. For the Holy Spirit to guide you, you just need to open your mouth and let him pray through you. Because your body is the house of prayer. When Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman in John 4, he said, the hour comes and now is 
when the two worshippers shall worship the Father in truth and in spirit, not in Jerusalem, not in this mountain. In truth and in spirit, truth is Jesus. Spirit here is the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, that's the gate, and in the spirit. That's exactly what I'm saying. They don't need to go a place. It's okay to meet on Sunday morning to celebrate what the Lord has done for us. But the temple is with you always. Because the temple of the living God is your body. Anywhere you go, you can raise an altar. You just release yourself to him and allow him to pray. Galatians 5.16, Paul tells us the secret of defeating that sin that so easily entangles us. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. If you don't want to do what the flesh is telling you to do, which is sin again is God, he's saying, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. How? Through prayer. Your body is his temple. Fellowship with him, not every day. Ah, 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 ah. Every moment, be in touch with him. You know, the purpose of the new covenant when Jesus died is that we don't have a priest presenting us to God. You are the priest God is using. And his house is not in Jerusalem or in Mecca or in Egypt or in Asia. His house is your body. And it's a house of prayer 24-7. Almost every Pauline epistle, he concluded with these words. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. The fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit, being in touch with him every moment, every breath you take. And we close our services in this church every Sunday with the words of the grace, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. How do you know that the Holy Spirit guides you? Hear me, church. This is the acid test. That when you're buying a house, it is the Holy Spirit who makes the decision. You are asking him, shall I, buy, shall I buy this house? Shall I live in this neighborhood? Shall I apply for this job? You're in touch with him. How do I respond in this interview? Is this my right life partner? Should I do this business? Should I go to this place? You're in communion with him. When you're driving, he's using your hands. He's driving using your hands. He's seeing through your eyes. He's speaking through your tongue. That's a life that is yielded, surrendered to the Holy Spirit. That's the answer. Because he cannot sin. He's holy. He's called the Holy Spirit. So when you yield yourself to him, you do the will of God. In fact, Paul writes in Romans 8.14 and says the acid test, the litmus test, of the true children of God. If you want to know who is a true child of God, it is those who are led by the Spirit of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Not those who just say, ah, ah, ah. It is those people in every single decision they make, God is involved. God leads them. God guides them. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is not an influence. He is not a force. He is a person. What does that mean? There are certain sins you can't do when you're with somebody you respect and honor. When you go to a hotel room far away where people don't know you, in Miami, in Los Angeles, in Seattle, in Toronto, Canada, in London, in Paris, where nobody knows you, there are certain things you can't do in that room if somebody you love and respect and honor walks into the room. When you recognize he's a person, then you don't want to grieve him. You don't want to offend him. You want to do the right thing in his presence, for he is with you 24-7. He is a person. You see, brothers and sisters, there are three types of people. There is the worldly person, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. The worldly person does whatever the world wants. They don't care. They don't care at all about the things of God. The carnal person loves Jesus but wants to do the desires of the flesh. The spiritual person is totally yielded to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives through them. He talks through them. He walks through them. My last scripture this afternoon, Matthew 26, 41, Jesus gave us a secret. Sorry, the secret 
to defeating that sin that so easily besets us. He said, quote, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. This is the Lord giving us the answer to a victorious Christian life. He said two things. That's it. Watch and pray. What is to watch? Take care of your inputs, what you see, what you hear, what you see on TV, on social media, what you see on magazines. Take care of what you see. You choose what you see. G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. Your output is proportional to your input. Take care of what you hear. What you hear, whether it's music, whether it's videos, whether it's talks, sermons, who do you listen to? Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Watch. Take care of what you see and what you hear. Take care of where you go. Take care. If you do this alone, you don't become a believer. You become a moralist. Jesus is saying two things. Watch and pray. Watching, taking care of the inputs is half the game. To complete the game, you surrender to the Holy Spirit through prayer. When you're in touch with God in prayer, when you're in touch with God in prayer, that's where you derive the power of God. If you watch alone, by the way, there are people who do the right things morally and they're not born again. They're not believers. They're not even Christians. And they do the right things morally. If you watch alone, you become a moralist. But God wants you to go beyond that and to have a fellowship with him. So he says, watch and pray so that you don't depend on your resolutions and determination. So you need to do both the watching, taking care of your inputs, and praying. God wants you to generate from the depth of your heart, depend on his power, depend on him. If you do that, you're going to defeat the three enemies. Your three enemies are the flesh, the world, and the devil. This flesh this body came from the dust of the earth. This body wants to do the will of the world. Then the world will always tempt you. Whether you like it or not, there are things around us that will always be wrong before God, and you keep seeing them. You keep hearing the wrong things. You may want to do all the right things, but there are people around you saying all the wrong things, doing all the wrong things. That's the world. So the world keeps tempting you, and of course the devil keeps tempting you to rebel against God. So Jesus is saying, to defeat these three temptations, watch and pray, and you shall not succumb to this temptation. Jesus is saying, I was there. I walked through the same life you're walking through. And this is, though I am God, this is how I defeated the flesh, the world, and the devil. Watch and pray. That's the secret of not yielding to temptation. If you yield to God, you will not yield to temptation. If you do not yield to God, you will yield to temptation. So my suggestion to you believers, when you're driving, when you're walking, whatever you're doing, just be in touch with God. Say a prayer. Talk to him. He's just a prayer away. Just talk to him. Just talk to him. Keep, keep in fellowship. Keep in communion. Don't be a Sunday Christian. Be an every second, every moment Christian, every single breath. Talk with him. Talk with him. Throughout. Keep in touch. Keep the lines open between you and heaven. Keep them open throughout. Amen? And if you're listening to me on YouTube or Facebook, and you have never given the Lord Jesus Christ your life, you're struggling with a certain sin, you're embarrassed because of that sin, this is your day to be set free from that prison. If you want to be set free from that prison, the very first step is to accept Jesus to be your Savior. Please pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. If you pray that prayer by faith, the Lord Jesus is in your heart. He will come into you and give you his Holy Spirit. And your life takes the right turn to do the right thing. Please, if you pray that prayer, write to me on this FB Live. I prayed to be saved. If you're following me from YouTube Live, please write to me on YouTube. I pray to be saved. Write as a comment. I'll share with you materials to help you grow as a Christian. Just write simple words. 
I pray to be saved, and I'll share with you materials to help you grow as a Christian.